This video describes flame transfer functions and how to measure them, focusing on the practical aspects. We'll first look at the definition of flame transfer functions, which we'll refer to as FTFs. We'll then describe the experimental setup and equipment required to measure them. At the end of the video is a demonstration of a flame transfer function being measured. An FTF describes the response of a flame to acoustic oscillations in a combustor, and it's a critical input to acoustic models that are used to predict the stability of a combustor. A thermoacoustically unstable combustor can experience strong acoustic oscillations that can disturb the flame stabilization, triggering a shutdown, and the vibrations can even cause direct mechanical damage. The acoustic oscillations are driven by oscillations in the heat release rate from the flame, which is responding to the acoustic oscillations, so a feedback loop is established. The FTF describes the amplitude and phase of harmonic oscillations in the heat release rate due to an acoustic field. The FTF is a function of frequency and is most often defined as shown on the screen. Q is the heat release rate, which is units of watts. U is the fluid velocity at reference position, typically chosen to be at the flame anchoring point or, for lifted flames, at a geometry transition in the combustor used to stabilize a flame. The prime symbols represent fluctuations around the mean. The hats denote that the variable is complex and therefore contains both the amplitude and relative phase of fluctuations the barred variables and mean values. So the magnitude of the numerator is the amplitude of the fluctuations in the heat release rate as a fraction of the mean. The denominator is the same thing, but for the velocity. The magnitude of the FTF is called the gain. A typical gain in the phase plot is shown on the screen. A gain of one implies that if the velocity was fluctuating at 5% of the mean, the heat release rate would also fluctuate at 5% of the mean. For premixed flames, where the equivalence ratio is unaffected by acoustic oscillations, the gain goes to 1 in the low frequency limit. This is because the flame remains in equilibrium with the flow, and the heat release is proportional at all times to the flow rate of reactants at the, rea at the reference position. At high frequency, the flame distortion becomes less for the same amplitude of velocity fluctuations, and the flame responds to multiple waves simultaneously, resulting in a superposition effect. These effects lead to a low pass behavior with the gain decreasing past the cutoff frequency. The phase of the FTF typically decreases linearly. This is because the phase is governed by a time delay from when disturbances caused by velocity fluctuations at the reference position can back to the average location of the heat release fluctuations. This time delay is almost unaffected by the frequency of the fluctuations. There are three caveats to be made before we get onto the more practical elements. Firstly, the flame transfer function presented here is sometimes called the flame frequency response, and some authors reserve the term flame transfer function for a function that takes into account dependence on growth rates. Secondly, it is commonly assumed that the flame response is linear, but it is important to recognize that this is a simplification. In particular, the flame response is well known to vary with the amplitude of the forcing, and this is critical if you want to predict the amplitude of a thermoacoustic instability. When the dependence on amplitude is also measured, we call it a flame describing function. However, the flame transfer function is sufficient to predict whether the combustor will be stable, which is the design goal. Thirdly, though the FTF may be well defined for simple combustor geometries, it can be challenging to define in complex geometries featuring piloted flames, such as are found in many modern gas turbine combustors. Predicting the FTF is very difficult, and it usually needs to be directly measured in the lab. We'll now describe some of the necessary equipment to measure an FTF for the burner geometry drawn on the screen. This is an axisymmetric burner, and the flame is stabilized by recirculation zones above the dump plane, which is used as the reference position for the velocity. Speaker drivers are mounted in a plenum below the flame to generate acoustic fields at a range of frequencies. You can see two speaker drivers mounted in the photo. Sirens can also be used to drive the acoustic oscillations for large flames. We will look at measuring the velocity first. One of the cheapest ways to accurately measure the fluid velocity is to use a hot wire, such as the Dantec Dynamics 55P11 shown on the screen. However, there are some practical challenges and a fundamental drawback with this method. The practical challenges are to do with calibration. Hot wires need to be calibrated. This is usually done using air prior to the experiment, but there can be some error if the fuel-air mixture has significantly different properties to just air. Radiative heat transfer may also be a problem and can be hard to quantify. The more fundamental drawback is that hot wires pick up all velocity fluctuations, including those that are not acoustic, for example periodic convective disturbances generated at geometry transitions. This may seem like an advantage, 
but the FTF is then more difficult to integrate into acoustic models. If the acoustic velocity disturbances can be isolated and measured, then the effect of convective disturbances are contained within the heat release rate oscillation. The FTF in this case is the flame's response to acoustic velocity fluctuations in contrast to the total velocity fluctuation. An alternative to a hot wire is to use the multiple microphone method. In this method, pressure fluctuations are measured in multiple locations. This allows the acoustic field to be reconstructed and the acoustic velocity to be computed. Condenser microphones are the most sensitive, but also the most fragile. We use piezo-resistive piezo pressure sensors made by Coolite. Two pressure measurements is usually sufficient, but it is good practice to use at least three so that each pair can be checked against one another for consistency. It is crucial to check the relative calibration between the pressure transducers, both for phase and amplitude. It is also recommended to check the velocity fluctuations predicted by the multiple microphone method with hot wire measurements. As well as being a valuable check, this can be very useful in identifying convective disturbances that may be filtered out in the multiple microphone method and may explain features of the FDF that would otherwise be mysterious. The mean velocity can be computed from the flow rates of air and fuel and the temperature of the mixture. Measuring the heat release rate is usually done by measuring the light emitted by the flame. This is quite accurate for a properly pre-mixed fuel-air mixture where there are no oscillations in equivalence ratio. The light emitted in certain bands of the visible and UV spectrum is known to be approximately proportional to the heat release rate. The light in these bands is emitted by intermediate radicals that are formed in the reaction zone in an electronically excited state. Visible light emitted by CH radicals at close to 430 nanometers is often used as a marker of heat release rate for hydrocarbon flames. However, synthetic fuels such as hydrogen and ammonia contain no carbon. Instead, UV emitted by OH radicals at close to 310 nanometers is typically used. The OH emission is also strong in hydrocarbon flames, so this is a versatile option. We use a Hamamatsu photomultiplier tube to measure the light emitted from the flame. An Edmund Optics bandpass filter is used that has a center wavelength of 310 nanometers and a full width at half maximum of 10 nanometers. It is important to check the linearity of the photomultiplier response, or to correct for nonlinearity. A simple check is to increase the flow rates of fuel and air while keeping the fuel to air ratio constant. The photomultiplier response should increase proportionally. Here we see a bandpass filter being mounted on the PMT. To avoid damage to the PMT, it's important that no power is supplied to it while it's exposed to ambient light. Additional tubes are installed in front of the filter, which block light from other sources. Here we're using lens tubes, lens mounts, and optical posts made by Thor Labs to secure the PMT. It's useful to have a cap for the PMT that's easy to put on and take off. This helps to avoid accidental saturation. And it's important to securely fix the PMT position so that, so that it doesn't move when taking off the cap. Here we see two PMTs being mounted on an aluminium rail. It's critical to place the PMT such that the same light intensity emitted anywhere in the flame would result in approximately the same number of photons reaching the PMT. This means that the distance between the PMT and the flame must be much greater than the width of the flame. The uniformity of the PMT response should be checked. Here we see a propane blowtorch being moved through the region of interest, with the PMT output displayed on an oscilloscope. LEDs are also useful for this purpose and can be mounted on a traverse to more accurately measure the PMT response to light emitted from different locations. Here, the flame is being ignited by a blowtorch. The flame stabilizes around the recirculation zone behind the bluff body and also partially extends down the outer shear layer of the annular jet. The fuel is a mixture of hydrogen and methane and is mixed with air well upstream of the flame and in a location where there are minimal acoustic oscillations that could cause fluctuations in the fuel to air ratio. The blue color is due to chemiluminescence from the CH radicals. Shown on the screen now is a lab UVI, designed and built by Hawkon Nigord, that we use to measure an FDF. This VI fully automates the process. The flame is shown at the top right. You can also hear the audio recorded next to the flame. What you're hearing is turbulent, turbulent flow noise, flame noise, and the tones generated by the speaker drivers. The VI communicates with the signal generator to set the frequency of the voltage signal sent to the speaker drivers and to tune the amplitude. The front screen of the signal generator is shown on the bottom right. Waveforms are displayed as they are required. The signal from the signal generator is shown in purple, the pressure signals in white, green and red, and the PMT signals in white and yellow with a mean of about 1 volt. 
The FTF is computed at each frequency and is displayed in a plot on the bottom left of the screen. Displaying the FTF as it's acquired is useful for identifying any faults in the equipment or any bugs in the code. The multiple microphone method is implemented in the VI to compute the amplitude of velocity fluctuation, and the voltage is iteratively adjusted to achieve the target amplitude. It's important to keep the amplitude of the velocity fluctuations constant at the reference position. Be aware that this is not the same as keeping the pressure amplitude constant at the pressure sensors. The amplitude should ideally be low, as the flame stability depends on the flame's response to small fluctuations in the absence of a large amplitude acoustic field. However, turbulent fluctuations create significant noise in the signals, and the amplitude must be high enough to achieve a reasonable signal-to-noise ratio. Typical velocity fluctuation amplitudes are around 5% of the mean velocity. This is the amplitude used in this demonstration. Complete FTFs should be acquired at multiple amplitudes. At low enough amplitudes, the FTF is usually relatively insensitive to the amplitude of the velocity fluctuation. It's important to report if this is not found to be the case. You'll notice that we can't see the flame responding by eye. This is because the frequency is too high for us to see the movement directly. At higher amplitudes of forcing, you start to see a shift in the shape of what we call the mean flame brush. The flame appears more distributed in space due to it moving back and forth in response to the forcing. And at low frequencies, lower than about 25 Hz, you may actually be able to see the flame rippling. In the plot on the bottom left, you can see that the lowest frequency we've used is 100 Hz, and that we increase in steps of 100 Hz. We finish at 2000 Hz. A smaller frequency step than this should be used if you want to capture all the features of the FDF. It's also important to recognize that the necessary frequency range and resolution will depend on the flame geometry and the flow field. Shorter flames and higher mean flow velocities have higher cutoff frequencies. Before we finish, take another look at the signal generator screen, shown at the bottom right, as the forcing frequency is changed. You'll notice that the signal amplitude, labelled AMP, iterates until the target velocity fluctuation amplitude is reached. 10 seconds of data is then recorded. We use extrapolation and interpolation in our iterations, and we set a maximum deviation from the target that determines whether we have sufficiently converged. It's recommended to also set a voltage limit to avoid blowing the speaker drivers. For further information on flame transfer functions, take a look at some of the literature shown on the screen. Also, check out the tutorials by NTNU's Jose Aguila and the recent publications from NTNU. Thanks for watching.